I'm here to answer the age-old question. Can you hack a 25-year-old game to render with modern graphics technology? Despite being released nearly a quarter of a century ago, Diablo 2 is still immensely popular, and despite Blizzard's attempt to resell the experience with their remastered edition, the original is still a lot of people's preferred option. However, there's some interesting hacks that you can do to get the most out of the original on modern hardware, hacks that are worth taking a deep dive into. So I bought a copy of the original from Blizzard, and because it's still for sale, I've not reverse engineered the CD key like I've had to for other games before. The problem is that it looks like total arse on my modern big screen monitor, and there's no settings to be able to change it. Looking around, and I've ended up at this Blizzard forum post, the gist is that Diablo 2 supports three rendering backends, Direct Draw, Direct 3D, and Glide. The game was optimised for the Glide API, but this isn't supported by modern graphics cards, unless you've got a Voodoo card lying around. So what some enterprising person done is write a Glide wrapper, basically to the game it thinks it's calling the Glide API, but really it forwards those calls onto OpenGL, a more modern API. Effectively, it's providing a translation layer between the old and the new API. Now, presumably this all works, but I don't see why Sven gets to have all the fun. This is an interesting problem to solve, so let's do it ourselves, but for Vulkan. If you're unaware, then Vulkan is a modern graphics API designed to give graphics programmers full control over their hardware. It's a similar design philosophy to DirectX 12 and Metal, and it's the API used to program the latest Doom games. The fun part is that Vulkan is immensely complicated. It takes hundreds of lines of code just to render a triangle and involves managing your own graphics card memory allocations and fences and semaphores, so presumably it's going to be quite a bit different to a 20 year old graphics API. First things first, we need to see how the game tries to load and interact with Glide. You can force the game to use the Glide backend by passing the flag dash 3dfx to the game, which obviously it's not happy about. Opening the game in Ghidra and tracing that flag through, we end up at this function, which tries to load the Glide DLL from disk and resolve all the functions. This will be our in. If we create our own library called glide3x.dll and export the same functions, then the game will happily load and call those for us. I found some old header files from the Glide API, so I've recreated the exact interface for the library with the correct arguments and types. I've just added a simple implementation that logs the call to a file, and I've built it as a shared Windows library. However, it's not loading. Of course, by default it's 64-bit, which Diablo certainly isn't. Okay, so it loads my library, but it crashes on the first call, somewhere in is bad read pointer. If we open up in a debugger, we can see that the args for the function are still on the stack after the function call, which suggests that the game was expecting the call e, i.e. the function, to clean it up. And if we look inside the function, we can see that there's just a ret at the end, so there is no stack cleanup from the function. This can be fixed by changing the calling convention to std call, which, among other things, will cause the emitted code to clean up the stack args at the end of the function. And now it can't find any of my functions. Turns out that when you use std call with msvc, it decorates the exported function names, essentially changing their names. But we can fix this by providing a def file, which tells the compiler, no, please don't change my function names for me. Okay, so we're starting to call more functions. So it's still getting an error, but from the log it's been called from GL Glide shutdown, so something is failing and presumably doing some cleanup. Tracing it through, we can see it's called from a function that deletes a critical section and frees the Glide library. And this is called as an at exit handler, so when the game exit, it automatically calls this function. So I've traced through the code and the failing call is GRSST win open, and the problem is entirely my fault. I naively assumed that returning zero would mean success and then any other integer would indicate a failure. However, if I'd bothered to read the documents, I would see that this function returns an fx bool, so in fact one means success and zero means failure. And after fixing that, it's calling some graphics looking functions. But now it crashed in gr text combine? Never mind, it was a bug in my code. Don't roll your own log library. So the program now ends after calling grtex min address and grtex max address. Hmm. So I found the docs for the Glide API and things are starting to make a bit more sense now. The way the Glide API works is you upload texture data to a specific address of your choosing in the texture map unit or TMU. But to find the address range you can copy to, you call grtex min address and grtex max address. As I just returned zero from both of these, the game thinks there's zero graphics memory and promptly exits. 
Now we're not emulating a TMU, we're just going to pass that data eventually onto Vulkan, so let's just let the game think it has the maximum possible amount of graphics memory. It works, kind of. We get the game sound and the continuous stream of glide commands in the log. So now we need to start wiring this up to Vulkan. Luckily, I've been playing around with Vulkan as part of a separate side project, so I've got a lot of the boilerplate already written. We've got a black box, we're basically done. Just got to figure out how to do Vulkan things within it now. So the game calls GR buffer swap at the end of the frame, so we can use that to issue some Vulkan draw calls. And we can render a random model. I mean, it's supposed to be rotating and it crashes after a few seconds, but it's a start. It doesn't like the size of my window. Hmm. Obviously need to pass was pop up to adjust window rect. Now I'm getting a weird Vulkan validation error. Vuk error out of date kahur. So apparently I need to recreate my swap chain, but now I get a vuk error native window in use kahur error. So most of the time a swap chain goes out of date, it is because the window was resized, but as far as I can tell I'm not resizing the window. However, having a look through my bodge log file, I can see there are several calls to the window open function with different resolutions. So maybe it's creating a separate window for the intro cinematic and then the game itself. I'm just going to add some hack into the code to ignore the first two calls. Kind of works. Audio still playing, and it doesn't crash. However, this model is supposed to be rotating. I think the frame rate isn't right. If I just increase the rotation speed, then it works. I'm pretty sure that's how most game bugs are fixed. I think the next step is to try and extract the textures, and looking through the logs and the docs, GR text download mipmap is probably the function we want. This allows you to specify the texture data at potentially multiple levels of detail. So the arguments are a bit strange, I was hoping for width, height and pixel format, but instead we've got small lod log 2 and large lod log 2. Small lod log 2 is the logarithmic base 2 of the largest dimension of the lowest resolution mipmap. Small lod log 2 is the logarithmic base 2 of the largest dimension of the lowest resolution mipmap. Small log log 2 is the logarithmic base 2 of the largest dimension of the lowest resolution mipmap. I am slowly descending into madness with this. Okay, so after passing the doc several times, I think I finally understand what's going on. Basically, your image data array can contain the same image at several different resolutions. Small log log 2 tells you what the smallest dimension of those images will be, and large log log 2 tells you the largest. But is that the width? Or the height? Well, for that you need to look at the aspect ratio log 2, which states that if the aspect ratio is positive, then s will be the larger dimension of the mipmap, and if it is negative, then t will be the larger dimension. So basically, given these three bits of information, you can infer how many images are in the data array and what their resolutions are. Or you can just use this lookup table the doc gives you. Remember, this log 2 nonsense was added in Glide 3, so just bear that in mind if you're porting code from Glide 2. Luckily for us, the game is just rendered as 2D sprites, so there's just one log level per image. Of course, just knowing the size doesn't really help us when we're staring down the barrel of a void pointer. We need to know what format the pixel data is in. I was hoping for RGB triplets or something easy to decode, but all our data is in format number 5, or P8. This is an 8-bit palette where each byte is actually an index into a table which stores the RGB values, so it's compressed via a lookup table. But where is the palette stored? This looks like it comes from the GR text download table, which has the GR text palette format. Seems a missed opportunity for a game called Diablo to not use the GR text palette 6666x format. So I capture the palette table in flight and use that data to decode and store the images to disk. They're kind of right, I can make out what they're supposed to be, but the colours are all wrong. If only I had read the docs. A colour palette is an array of 256 ARGB colours, not RGB colours, even though it says that the alpha component is ignored. Fixing that and a few other bugs, and now I can dump all the game's textures as they're loaded. Nice. Now for the rendering. It looks like the game is using GR Draw Vertex Array Contiguous. One of my favourites. The args are pretty straightforward, which is a surprise given what we've seen so far. Mode says how to interpret the vertices, count is how many vertices, a pointer to the vertex data, and the stride, which is the distance in bytes between each block of vertex data. All the calls are in triangle fan mode, and we have four vertices, so 
presumably we're rendering 2D sprites as quads. So how does Glide know how to interpret the data hanging off this void pointer? That's done by some preceding calls to GR vertex layout, which tells the API what each block of vertex data looks like. For us, that's an XY chord, a Q param that seems to always be one, a vertex color, which seems to always be white, and then the texture coordinates. I've recreated this layout as a struct so we can interact with the raw vertex data. Interestingly, its size is 24 bytes, but the stride is 28 bytes, so maybe there's some padding? Just had a minor disaster. Whilst I'm not actually rendering anything to the screen, it's still accepting mouse clicks, and I accidentally clicked something on the blank screen which caused the game to update, and now every time I run it, I just get this error box. Ah, a reinstall has fixed it, which is a relief. I've converted these draw calls to Vulcan calls, and I get a blank screen, which is not what I was expecting. Using RenderDoc, I can see the sprites being sent to Vulcan, but there's a lot that can go wrong here. Difference in Glide and Vulcan coordinate systems, different winding order, a bug in my Vulcan code. A lot of graphics debugging is trying to figure out why a screen is blank when you would 100% like it to not be. Anyway, I had a few bugs which I fixed, and I realised that Glide was supplying the coordinates in screen space, and I needed to translate those to normalised device coordinates. Obviously. So now we can draw a random coloured quad wherever the game will draw a texture. So now we just need to connect up the textures. Due to the differences in API, my initial thought was just to use bindless textures. This is a unbounded global array of textures that the shaders can access, and then as the game was loading the textures, I could just update that global array and provide each sprite with an index into that. Ironically, this would then mean that the game would require a fairly modern graphics card. However, like everything in Vulkan, it's pretty complicated, and the mess of Vulkan code that I've lashed together to get me this far doesn't really lend itself well to this design. So instead, I'm just going to update the descriptor set to have one large fixed size array that's bound to the fragment shader. I'm wondering what the maximum number of textures I can bind at once is. The Oracle says it's 128, however my GPU says it'll handle 104,876, so I think we're going to be okay. So I've uploaded all the textures and it doesn't look right. Getting better. And we're pretty much there. All of these graphical issues are definitely solvable problems, however the real issue is that Glide and Vulkan are just chalk and cheese when it comes to API design. Glide is a state machine where you just update the state that you need for each call, and Vulkan is just a full control over your hardware beast. The current solution relies on you running the game for a bit, dumping the textures, and then the Vulkan run, uploading them all in one go to the GPU, so if the game accesses textures in a different order between runs, then it will just get out of sync which is probably what's happening here. Of course, the ideal solution would be to modify the Vulkan to upload these textures on the fly, but then you have to handle the synchronization between various queues and pipelines. And not to ruin the illusion of YouTube magic, but it's taken me four weeks just to get to this, and my brain is starting to melt from juggling two completely different graphics APIs. But if you found this low-level dive fun and want to see how I reverse-engineered the original StarCraft game, then check out this next video.